Welcome to another Doodly Pro tutorial. So this time we're going to take a look at depth of field and two different ways you can do it inside of 3D Studio Max. The first way, using only 3DS Max's built-in camera blur. And the second, which is rendering out a Z-depth pass, which allows you to have full control of the depth of field settings in post-production using programs like Photoshop and After Effects. Now I think depth of field is sometimes overlooked by 3D animators, but actually it can be a very powerful tool. It can give your animations a boost in quality and make it look much more cinematic. Plus if we look at this example from the movie Tangled, we can see that if depth of field is used properly, along with the shot composition, you can literally direct where your audience is looking. Notice in this still frame that the first thing your eyes are drawn to is the lantern in the foreground. Even though that lantern is not in the center of the screen, it is still a center of attention. Why? Because he's fully in focus, and the rest of his lantern buddies are nicely blurred out in the background. Well, that's enough of that. Let's get into some 3D Studio Max. So here we are in 3D Studio Max, and as you can see, I've already set up a basic scene for us to play around with. All that's in here is some simple text with each of the letters spread out through Z space. I've also created a seamless backdrop using just a plane and the bend modifier. And I have just a standard Omni light floating up here. So the first thing you want to do in your scene to set this up for depth of field is create yourself a camera. So I'm just going to fly in here, kind of get the basic position set up for myself, and hit Control C. That'll create us a target camera that we can use. And whenever I'm working with cameras in 3D Studio Max, I like to set up my viewport just a little bit differently. So I'm going to go back to my multi-view, and I'm going to grab the edge of the viewport right here in the middle and drag it up. Now I have two medium-sized viewports to work in. And what I'll do is go to this viewport, change it from wireframe to smooth plus highlights, click on where it says left, change it to my camera, and whenever I'm in the viewport that I'm going to be rendering from, I always enable show safe frame, which will show us the renderable area of our scene. Then I'll go back to this viewport and change it back to my perspective view. Now I'm able to fly around in this viewport and change all my settings without affecting my camera. So what I'm gonna do is quickly position the camera, dolly in, and that looks pretty good. Now let's start working with our depth of field. I'm just gonna select our camera, make sure I'm in the modify tab, scroll down a bit, and make sure I enable multi-pass effects. One quick thing to keep in mind when you enable the multi-pass effect is that if you're using the default scan line render in 3ds Max, you want to make sure that just depth of field is selected from your drop-down. If you want to use the mental ray renderer, then you want to make sure you select depth of field for mental ray. For this tutorial, I'm going to be using the default scan line render, so I'm just going to leave the standard depth of field selected. Now that we've enabled the multi-pass effect and make sure we have depth of field selected, we can select this viewport here and click render. As you can see right away with just the default settings, we're already getting some sort of camera blur. So now let's mess with the settings. So what we notice from our render, the P is almost in focus, and the R and the O in the background are much more out of focus. And the focal point is all determined by this camera's target position. If we move the target position right next to the P, when we re-render again, the P will completely be in focus. And likewise, if we'd like to shift the focus all the way back to the O, just move the camera's target all the way back in line with the O, reposition it a little bit, then select our camera again. And if you'd like a little time saver tip, if we click on this preview button in the multi-pass effect settings, 3ds Max will give us a quick preview of the depth of field without rendering any of the lighting, shadows, and reflections, and so on. So now we can see in the viewport that the P is out of focus, and the O is completely in focus. Now let's play around with some of the focus settings. Now if we scroll down to the depth of field parameters, there's going to be three main numbers we want to be taking a look at. First, total passes. The higher this number is, the higher the quality of the blur is going to be. But it will also up the render time too. Maybe we can boost this up to 20 and see what we got. That causes the blurriness of the P to be much softer. If we turn the passes down to say 5, we can see the render is much faster, but we have this weird ghosting effect going on. Now the sample radius number has to do with how shallow your depth of field is. Right now if we boost this up to 3 and render our scene, you can see it makes both the P and the R much more out of focus. But also we reintroduce more of that nasty ghosting effect. And to fix that we'd have to go back in to our total passes and boost that number up even higher, which would take even longer to render. So I'm going to keep this at a lower number for right now. Probably go back to 1. Shift this back to 20. Now the third number is the sample bias. And I don't usually change this too much. Maybe we'll put it up to 1 and see what happens. You can experiment however you want in your own scenes and see what settings work best for you. So that's the basic steps for setting up depth of field inside of 3D Studio Max. It's not a bad way to add 3D depth of field into your animations if 3DS Max is the only thing you have to work with. But I feel it has two major downfalls. 
First off, the camera focus is part of your animation. Once it's rendered, it's rendered. And if you want to change something, you'll have to re-render that part of your animation. And second is the increase in render time. So right now, if I go into my scene and I want to add some soft shadows using maybe a skylight, pop a skylight in our scene, turn cast shadows on and turn the samples down to maybe 10 for now. When I go to render, you can see it takes much more time. It's still only on its first pass and it has 19 passes more to go. And that's definitely way too long to wait for an animation. So we're gonna cancel this. Now I'm gonna show you something super useful that'll allow you to do all your focus pulling and depth of field settings in post-production called a Z-Pass. Now setting up a Z-Pass is super simple. First, we're just gonna select our camera, go to our Modify tab, and make sure we disable the multi-pass effect. We don't need it to create its own depth of field anymore because we're gonna be doing that in post-production. Next, what I'm gonna do is go up to my Render Settings, and I'm gonna to go to my Render Elements tab. Under Render Elements, we wanna click on Add and scroll all the way down to the bottom where Z Depth should be. Select that, press OK. And down here, if we click on this button, we can tell the Z-Pass where to save to and what format to use. Call this Z Test. Click Save. It's asking us what quality we wanna use. I'm just gonna put it at best, OK. And now we're ready to render our Z Depth. So we're gonna go and make sure we have our camera viewport highlighted and hit the Render button. Hope for the best. Hey, did you hear that? Was that my phone or yours? I don't think it was mine. You better check. And there we go. Our render doesn't look too bad. Everything's in focus. It's a little on the bright side, but that's okay. We'll take care of that later. The interesting part is that if I bring it in frame, we get this other strange black and white render. This is our Z depth pass. And the way the Z pass works is it renders out a separate image that's a gradient going from white to black. And we can use this image in post-production to get our depth of field. But this here isn't exactly what we're looking for. We want it to be a much more gradual fade from light to dark. So we're gonna close these two, go back to our render setup, in the Render Elements tab, we're gonna make a few changes. If we scroll down here, you'll see a Z Min and Z Max. That's the minimum and maximum distance that a Z Pass will be rendered. So that P is pretty close to the camera. So I'm gonna change the Z Minimum to 50. Then our Z Pass render faded to black pretty quickly. So I'm gonna change Z Maximum to something like 750. And also a good workflow tip when you're using a Z Depth Pass, when you're testing the Z Minimum and Maximum distance, you want the render to be as fast as possible so you're not wasting any time when all you want to do is check to see that the Z-Pass looks right. So what you don't want is a scene full of reflections and advanced lighting, stuff that slows the render down. So what you want to do is temporarily disable things that'll slow the render down like advanced lighting, final gather, global illumination, reflective materials, and so on. All I have in my scene right now that's slowing down my render time are my soft shadows coming from my skylight. So I'm going to go and select my skylight and turn cast shadows off just so we don't have to wait that extra render time. And then when we're done testing and ready for our final render, we'll turn it back on. So make sure our camera view is selected and I'm going to press render. So it's much faster. And we'll take a look at our Z depth pass. And this one will give us much more information to work with. So that looks good. What I'm gonna do is close these, select my skylight again, turn cast shadows up, and this will be our final render. So we can go ahead and go crazy, turn this up to 15. And I also want to select my Omni light because it was a little too bright. Change it to maybe 0 0.7. Yeah, that'll work. And now I'm going to render our scene. <clears throat> Hello? Yes, I'd like to order a large pizza with just uh, mushroom and sausage on it, please. Yep, that should be everything. Okay, thanks. Okay, bye. So there we go. We have both our standard render and our Z pass. So make sure you save both these images separately and we'll hop over to Photoshop where I'll show you how to use these in post-production. So here we are in Photoshop CS3. This will work exactly the same in all the other Photoshops that have the lens blur filter. So I'm going to grab both my renders, drop them in. First thing I need to do is take my Z depth image and go to select all and edit copy. And I'm going to jump over to the normal render and go to my channels tab. And in here, we need to add our Z pass as an alpha channel. But since I rendered this out as a JPEG, it doesn't have an alpha channel. But there's an easy way around that. All we need to do is hit the Create New Channel button, and it gives us an alpha where we can just go to Edit and paste it in there. And then I'm just going to click on RGB to make sure it turns back on, go back to Layers, and we're good. 
we can deselect that. And here comes the great part. All we need to do is go up to filter, go under blur, select lens blur. And the first thing you'll notice is everything's out of focus. But if we go over to the depth mat, we can change it from layer mask to alpha. And since we dropped the Z pass in the alpha, you can see we have our depth of field. And the best part is the blur focal distance. Right now the P is in focus, but if we want the O in focus, we just drag it back here. And then more blur settings are down here. I like to keep the radius pretty low. And also Photoshop's lens blur has this nice little feature. When you mouse over the image, it gives you a little crosshair. And whatever you click that crosshair on will come into focus. So you don't have to try and guess the blur focal distance. Then press OK. And we have post-production depth of field. Now just when you thought this technique couldn't get any better, I'm going to jump into After Effects and use the same exact lens blur technique. So I'll just drop in my files, the Z in here, and then put the test on top. And with our test layer selected, we can go up to our effect, blur and sharpen, and we're going to look for lens blur. In the newer versions, this is called something like camera lens blur. It's the same exact thing, just looks a little different in here. I'm sure you'll figure it out. The first thing I like to do in here is check repeat edge pixels so that we don't get that weird fall off on the edge of our image. And then we're going to change our depth mat layer just like we did in Photoshop, except instead of using the alpha like we did, we can just go and select layer number two, which is our Z pass. Turn the iris radius down just like in Photoshop. And as you can see, using the blur focal distance, we can change what part of the image is in focus and what part of the image is out. Now this lens blur doesn't have the fancy little crosshair that we can select what we want to be in focus like we do in Photoshop. So what I do to make sure what I need to be in focus is completely in focus is turn up the iris radius very high, which that really ups the blur. And we can see that the P is not quite in focus. So I'll just shift the blur focal distance a little more. And there, that P's much sharper. Now I can turn the iris radius back down to 8. And then I know for certain that P is completely in focus. And naturally, our blur focal distance and all these other settings are completely able to be animated. Just hit the stopwatch. We see it started a new keyframe with the blur at that focal distance. We can move to the end and shift it so that the O is completely in focus. And we just create ourselves a nice little rack focus. Well, that's it for this depth of field tutorial. I hope it helped you out. If you'd like to see more of our tutorials, you can check out the Doodly Pro YouTube channel page at youtube.com slash doodlypro. Also, we're adding new tutorials all the time. So if you'd like to stay up to date with the new tutorials, feel free to hit that subscribe button. And don't worry, it's free. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you on the next tutorial.